Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us today. I am Francesca Regalado, a senior at the School of Diplomacy and the managing editor of the Diplomatic Envoy, the school's undergraduate foreign affairs newspaper. I am honored to serve as your master of ceremonies, to welcome Administrator Peter Neffinger to campus, to welcome and to introduce the Dean of the School of Diplomacy, Andrea Bartoli. We will hear today about the Administrator's transformation of TSA. We have our own transformation happening at this school as well, thanks to Dean Bartley. Dean Bartley is transforming our school with a focus on collaborative leadership, empowering the school's community near and far, alumni, students, faculty, and friends, to lead the school together to new heights in its next 20 years. This is evidenced by your presence here, by those watching us and tweeting from all over the world via live web stream, hello fellow diplos, and the leadership of student ambassadors who have been instrumental in today's program. Thank you, Dr. Bartley, for encouraging us to develop a culture of professionalism. Please join me in welcoming our audience. It's great to be here and not be in charge. So I heard these words for the first time as you were listening. So it's quite impressive, actually. So thank you. Very, very nice. Welcome, welcome to all. Welcome from the School of Diplomacy, a new kind of professional school where the best of liberal art and academic tradition meets the challenges of 21st century work. Here at Diplomacy, we take professional commitment seriously in the classroom and in the world at large. We know that no one becomes professional automatically when they graduate. Professionalism is now. A diplomacy, you are expected to be professional from day one in everything that you do, including this welcome. Thank you, Francesca. Today's event has been organized and is executed with student by student. A diplomacy faculty, student, and administrator collaborate for the good of all. I like to think of myself as someone who continues to learn, a student of diplomacy, a professional of international affairs, committed to learning. Yes, this is the way we are here today. Learning more, learning together, learning again, learning from someone who has made a difference. I am uh, eager to learn more about the remarkable turnaround the administrator had implemented at TSA. Um, he, um, Administrator Defender, uh, has been defined by our, one of our distinguished uh, Sidonol alumni, uh, Roger Dow, a friend that you know, uh, the CEO of a U.S. Travel Association, as the real deal. Uh, Roger said, um, Pete has diplomatically presented a compelling case for the need for transformation evolution and gained respect as tell it like it is leader who steadfastly operates with the country's best interest guiding his effort to, the right, to do the right thing. End of, quote from, end of quote from Roger. Since my coming to Sidon Hall, I've been impressed by the dedication of alumni like him, like Roger, and Mohammed. Maghari, who is here, uh, who will, uh, who, uh, from whom we will hear shortly, for the dedication to lead Sidon Hall and Christine, we have just heard uh, before, um, bring the extraordinary leader like Administrator Nefendra to start the leadership and professional, to share their leadership and professional experience with our community. It is connection like this that makes our school professional culture possible. I'm delighted that we could all come and stay, learn from the administrator, and be with him. Indeed, the world needs diplomacy, especially at this time. It needs learning for the good of all. Indeed, sincere thanks to Administrator Nefendra for choosing the School of Diplomacy for this important message and rich learning opportunity. Welcome to all.
Thank you, Dean Bartley. I would like to now introduce Father Brian Muthas. Father Brian is an assistant professor at the School of Diplomacy, an expert on international security, defense systems, and ethics, and the director for the school's Center on UN and Global Governance Studies. In his spare time, he follows his higher calling and will grace us today with an invocation. Please welcome Father Brian. Let us place ourselves in a spirit of prayer. O oh God, the human family addresses you by many names and in many ways. I will address you in the Catholic manner. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the third chapter of the book of Exodus, we read that as Moses stood before the burning bush, the Lord said to him, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place you stand is holy ground. The Lord then entrusted Moses with the task to lead his chosen people out of bondage into freedom. When TSA employees tell travelers to remove their footwear, it is not because airports are holy ground, but because the Transportation Security Administration has been entrusted with the task to protect the nation's transportation systems to ensure freedom of movement for people and commerce. And so we pray. Heavenly Father, gracious God, bless the men and women of the TSA. Keep them vigilant and alert that they may provide efficient security for transportation and effective counterterrorism for the traveling public. Bless this evening's event and all who are present, that what is said, heard, and done here may foster innovation, improvement, and excellence in the security environment through which travelers journey, so that passengers, in full possession of their privacy and with full enjoyment of their civil liberties, may travel in greater safety and in larger freedom. We ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father Brian. I am very excited today to introduce one of our own, Mohammed Mirgahari, is not only the senior advisor to the Chief of Staff for the Transportation Security Administration, but he also rece received his bachelor's degree in communications and marketing and his master's in corporate and public communications from Seton Hall University. We have him to thank for the opportunity to hear Administrator Neffinger speak today. Mohammed has spent the past 13 years working in key leadership positions within the Department of Defense. Fellow Diplos who are struggling to get through finals in advanced language classes this month, take heart. Mohammed's fluency in Farsi, Dari, and Tajik was put to immediate and productive use. Mohammed served in multiple global locations, including deployments to Afghanistan, in support of the global war on terrorism. His domestic posts include Special Operations Command Central at MacDill Air Force Base, where he provided expertise in support of the worldwide use of the special operations elements of the Army, Marine Corps, Navy, and the Air Force. In May 2016, the White House appointed Mohammed to his current role at TSA. Mohammed is a 2016 recipient of the Secretary of Homeland Security's Award for Excellence in recognition of his outstanding work for the TSA and of numerous additional commendations and awards from the Department of Defense, the Pentagon, NATO, and the National Security Agency. Please join me in welcoming Mo back home to Seton Hall.
I have double duty today. First, to introduce my boss, TSA Administrator Peter Neffinger, and second, to welcome Administrator Neffinger to the home of the Pirates in my alma mater, Seton Hall University. On September 11, 2001, I stood on the roof of Walsh Gymnasium, watching the tragedy unfolding at the World Trade Center. I saw the second plane hit the second tower. It changed my life forever. It would inspire me to join the fight against those who murdered my fellow Americans. I believe Seton Hall is the appropriate setting for Administrator Neffinger to talk about TSA. The agency was among the first actions our nation took in response to 9-11, and we were just across the river from the scene of one of the terrorist attacks. Another is our proximity to Newark, where Flight 93 took off that same September morning. No way that flight was ever going to reach its target, not with so many passengers from New York, Philadelphia, and New Jersey. Flight 93 was America's first triumph that tragic day. It is that legacy of triumph that TSA embraced and made its own. Our transportation system is vital to our nation's prosperity, so it is no surprise that it remains a high-value target for terrorist organizations. The recent detonation of explosives on aircraft above the Sinai and Mogadishu and the airport bombings in Brussels and Istanbul underscore this point. Today's terrorists, like pathogens, environmental disasters, and computer viruses, know no borders. Today's terrorists are tech savvy, skillful users of social media, and are determined. Terrorists innovate, and we must too. We must constantly explore new and innovative ways to detect, disrupt, and defeat the threat they pose. We do that every day under the leadership of Peter Neffinger. I met Administrator Neffinger last May when I first came on board at TSA. The transformation he will talk about today was starting to take root. From the perspective of my experience at the Department of Defense, I quickly realized what Administrator Neffinger intended us to be, a risk-based, intelligence-driven, professional counterterrorism agency dedicated to protecting the U.S. transportation system, but more importantly, the people who use it. When Administrator Neffinger came to TSA, many questioned whether the agency was capable of fulfilling its security mission. It's no surprise why the President chose Peter Neffinger to write the ship. In a Coast Guard career that spanned more than three decades, he was a recognized expert in crisis management and most notably served as the Deputy National Incident Commander for the 2010 BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Today, as, an agency, today as a result of the changes Administrator Neffinger introduced agency-wide, we are the premier transportation security agency in the world. Everyone has an image of TSA, a story about who we are and what we are. Set aside your own stories and listen to the story Administrator Neffinger is going to tell today. It is a story of an agency created almost overnight in crisis 15 years ago, but which has become a nimble and innovative agency against a creative, ruthless, and determined terrorist threat. It is the story of where we were, where we are, and where we will be. It is a story that is largely untold until now. So please join me in welcoming the man who is the chief author of this story, TSA Administrator Peter Neffinger. Thank you very much for your introductions here. I know um, uh, Dean Halpin is somewhere out there. Uh, there, she, there she is in the back. And, um, and others, thank you, for, thank you for the invitation to be here. It's a real privilege and honor uh, to come speak to you all tonight. And, uh, and of course, a, a hearty welcome to our TSA folks, uh, some of whom are sitting here in the front row. And I didn't realize I, was, I had so many distinguished alums uh, among my uh, among my staff, but it's wonderful. And then I have a guaranteed um, clap audience out here in my family. Uh, my my in-laws are in the audience, as is my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, and um, and my niece. So thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, so you know, I like telling stories about TSA, and I hope that as you listen, as Mo said, that you'll get you'll set aside your own notions for a bit of who and what you think we are and maybe come to understand and share some of the excitement uh, that, that those of us who work in TSA really have for this agency. 
Now, earlier this year, in speaking to the challenges I found at TSA, I talked about our identity, about who and what we are, and I said that our transformation began by changing the way we defined ourselves. We said out loud and collectively that we were security professionals, that we worked in an intelligence-driven, an agile, and an adaptable counterterrorism agency focused on the security of our nation's transportation systems. We all retook the oath of office, and I think you saw uh, one of the videos where we showed taking the oath of office. That's something that everybody in the agency did. We learned that changing how we defined ourselves really changed everything. And so today I'd like to continue that story by telling what I, what I call the next chapter and highlighting how that renewed sense of identity allowed us to become more innovative and truly entrepreneurial. But I'm going to start with a different story, one from my maritime background. So Malcolm McLean was one of seven children of a North Carolina farm family growing up during the Great Depression. Starting with a used truck that he bought to help his family get his goods to market, he eventually built the fifth largest trucking company in the world, or in the United States. Might have been the fifth in the world, too. Uh, well, that's interesting, but that's really not the story I want to tell. Here's a story about Malcolm McLean that I like. One day he was sitting in one of his trucks on the docks in Hoboken, New Jersey, waiting and waiting and waiting to transfer his truck's contents to the ship that he was supposed to put it on. And he was watching as the longshoreman loaded cargo net after cargo net, moving a few boxes and crates at a time to the ship's hold. It was driving him nuts. He thought it would be a lot easier to just pick up his truck and stick it on the ship, straight on board. Well, that simple disruptive thought stuck with Malcolm McLean for nearly 20 years. And in 1956, he turned that idea into a reality. And standing near those same docks, he watched as the very first container ship, the ship that he had bought, his ship, filled with new shipping containers, set out to sea. And that initial voyage spurred the complete transformation of the shipping industry. Now, there's a number of useful lessons from this story, but here's the one I like. And here's how I choose to view what Malcolm McLean did. He wasn't just looking at an inefficient process for loading ships. I mean, it was certainly that. I think what he saw was that the way in which ships were loaded was a crippling component of an otherwise efficient system of transporting goods from origin to destination, a system that had become dramatically more efficient through improved highway infrastructure, warehousing, larger and more reliable and capable conveyances, and other such things. And to most people, the system worked well enough because most people only think about their individual piece of the system. I mean, longshoremen were doing what longshoremen always do, right? You take a little box, you put it in a crate, you put it in a bigger box, you put it in a net, you load it onto a ship. Now, I, I didn't know Malcolm McLean, so I'm making some of this stuff up in his head, but I'm choosing to think that he instinctively understood that the real mission, the job, was to move stuff from origin to destination safely, efficiently and effectively. And trucking companies like his were part of a vast and interconnected system. So he transformed the system because he understood the system. Well, like Malcolm McLean, TSA had to understand that we too were part of a vast and interconnected system, and that our actions directly affected the security, the efficiency, and the effectiveness of the entire transportation system. We had to understand our real mission, our true purpose, and why we really exist. Well, when I got to TSA in July of 2015, what I found was an agency in crisis and under pretty intense scrutiny. There had been testing failures, allegations of management practices that were questionable, and we were disconnected from the industries and the public that we served. Indeed, TSA's public image, maybe the one that you all have, was largely that of long security lines punctuated by a uniform security officer at an airport checkpoint. And for many, we were the agency that got in your way and we, and we intruded upon your travel. And you know, we are the retail face of government and you've got to pass by us if you want to travel on an aircraft. And when you do, we examine your things, we examine you, and sometimes we even touch you physically. That's a pretty unpleasant experience. Well, what I found was an agency that to a large extent had fully adopted this image and one that had become inured to criticism. In fact, uh, at one individual said to me during one of my early briefings as I was going through confirmation and getting, and getting installed in the job, he looked at me and said, you know, boss, you just got to understand people don't like us. Uh, it just comes with the job. And uh, of course, my first reaction was, you know, I've never worked for an agency people don't like. I really, I really don't want to start right now. 
Um, but anyways, what I found was we were just hunkered down, disconnected, and pretty resistant to change. We had become the things we do. But what I also found were dedicated people, and some with many years of service to TSA. Some had even been at the agency since rollout. The wonderfully evocative term that you used with justifiable pride to describe the Herculean and quite remarkable effort to stand up an agency of nearly 60,000 people in just a matter of months. And you heard a little bit of that when you saw Bill Hall's video when he talked about being picked to be the first security director right after 9-11. But think about the task people like Bill Hall faced 15 years ago. Replace a disparate, disconnected system of private screening contractors at nearly 450 airports across the country and do so with a federal workforce without interruption in operations. Establish security oversight for every mode of transportation, aviation, rail, transit, over-the-road buses, maritime, even pipelines. If it moves, protect it. And then picture people in borrowed offices working long hours, sketching out on notepads the thousands of things you need to do to create an operating agency out of whole cloth. And then do all of that in the anxious, uncertain months following 9-11 when it seemed as if the next attack could occur at any moment. And in fact, it almost did in December of 2001, when an individual attempted to detonate the explosives packed into his shoes on a flight from Paris to Miami. So this job was pretty serious business. And the system had failed, and they had to fix it, and they had to fix it fast. And they were under intense pressure to do so. So they had to be innovative, and they had to be daring. And people from all walks of life came together, from the private sector, from the airlines, the airports, the FAA, in fact, all across government, came together to do something that had never been done before. Well, that's a pretty amazing story. And so I really thought we needed to recapture that spirit of innovation and daring. We really needed to reconnect to the sense of purpose and mission that had energized that rollout. We know that's easier said than done. There's a lot of resistance to doing things differently. And traditionally, you know, government nurtures the status quo, uh, whereas entrepreneurial thinking points in new directions and it thrives on change. But as the Malcolm McLean story illustrates, we needed to get past entrenched thinking in order to see ourselves as part of a larger system, in our case, one that ensures the security of our nation. And to do so, we needed to overcome the tendency for large organizations to get locked into a set way of doing things. So think about an operating agency, and, and that's what TSA is. I mean, it has to do something every single day, just like the longshoremen working on the docks. And there's little incentive to change because the status quo works pretty good, and it works well enough. And we have an entire system built to support it. We've invested a lot in that system. It's comfortable, it's predictable, and changing it is hard and disruptive. TSA screens some two million travelers every single day. And we have a lot of process built around that. But as you saw from some of the videos that you watched, TSA is a lot more than passenger screening. That's simply one of many activities that we do. What we really do is secure a vast, complex, interconnected global transportation system that underpins our economic health, and in the United States employs one out of every seven workers. It's a big system, it's a pretty important system. And we don't and we can't do that by ourselves. We don't, we don't own that system. Airlines, airports, rail operators, transit providers, trucking and shipping companies, pipeline operators, other government agencies, travelers, people like you, and many more are key players and co-owners in the security of the system. So it turns out that our mission includes aligning all of those elements to work together with us to keep the transportation system operating efficiently and securely. So, where do you start? Well, first you have to figure out how to begin to drive change in your own agency. And we started by looking for the change leaders in our own organization and giving them permission, encouragement, and support. So here's one example. TSA had no centralized, coordinated, or, consi or consistent approach to training. But, but in my experience, training is the foundation of mission success, and it's a powerful tool to galvanize and lead change. It provides consistency, develops a common culture, instills core values, improves morale, and it increases performance. Think about your experience here at Seton Hall. All of those things. I mean, I heard the, uh, the pride in the patriots. Uh, so there's a, there's a culture that's developed by training. Well, we needed to do all that because we, were, we had some legitimate concerns that were tossed our way. 
in the wake of some revelations about a year and a half ago. So I asked a lot of questions about training when I got here. And as it turned out, TSA had a pretty creative training and development team. And they had built a pretty good plan to, to establish a full-time resident TSA academy that would provide the consistent discipline and professional training across the workforce that, uh, that we needed. But budget cuts, our own internal bureaucracy, organizational inertia, all of these had stymied the plan and we were years, if ever, from seeing its realization. You know, any, anytime somebody tells you we can do this in five years, it means you'll never do it. It's always five years away. If they tell you there's a checkpoint of the future out there in five years from now, it's going to be five years now, anytime you ask the question. So, so I'm interested in things that happen right now. I'm interested in knowing what's available right now to make the change you need to make right now. So I like the idea of the academy. I really like the idea of an academy. I didn't like the idea that we were years away from getting it done. But I thought it was innovative, I thought it was forward thinking, and I thought it addressed a lot of the challenges that we were immediately facing. So, I asked this team, could you accelerate that? Could you, could you get it done in three months? And in other words, I asked my team, if I gave you permission, and if I found the support, could you do it right now? Well, no joke. I mean, at, at first they thought it was a joke, but, but I said it wasn't a joke. So they said, they came back no joke and said, I think we can do that. And of course, we needed money, we needed a place to build it, and we needed approval from the administration and Congress, but we could do it. So, assuming we could get all those things, I figured we could get our academy established. So we went to work and we built a very strong case. And we got support from the president, we got support from Congress, and just three months later, last January to be exact, we established the first ever full-time TSA Academy at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Centers in Glencoe, Georgia. And we started new hire training every single person through that academy. So the key point here is, is we looked for talented and creative people within, we gave them permission and support, we said, take the risk, be entrepreneurial, and then from the top of organization, we aggressively drove the change. Yeah, and what's interesting about that is as you do that, as we transformed our training, we really started to reconnect to our mission, to see that larger mission that I talked about. And that in turn accelerated our thinking about how we could drive change across the agency. So that's the approach we've used over the last year and a half to stimulate innovation, to reconnect with that entrepreneurial spirit of rollout. But we also found out that changing a few processes and systems, installing a training, that's not, that wouldn't be enough. You need a way to continue to grow and sustain the effort to, to inside. You need a way to support that. So let me tell you how we're moving down that road. At the busiest airports, we needed a faster means of moving people through checkpoints, given the year-over-year -year dramatic increases in the number of travelers moving through airports. You all remember the long lines in airport security. We made a lot of front-page news this last year. Um, something that they don't tell you about when you're getting ready for confirmation for a job like this. But, um, but I will tell you that uh, being on the front page of the newspaper gets your attention, uh, and sometimes it gets your attention, especially when they're yelling at you all the time. Well, I'm gonna tell you, those long lines are more than just an inconvenience and a frustration to you, and more than just a stress maker for me. Uh, they were a real con security concern. As Mo already explained, you know, large crowds in public places are attractive targets for terrorists. I know. You know I, I had arrived in Brussels airport at the morning when suicide bombers killed 32 people and killed over and injured over 300 more. I was right there and I witnessed the aftermath and I knew that we couldn't let that kind of thing happen here. So moving people more efficiently into secure areas was a lot more than just convenience to travelers. It was a security imperative. And we had an intriguing opportunity. Automated screening lanes that were already in operation in London and Amsterdam. These seem like a pretty good idea. These are just, you know, right now, you, when you go up the lane right now, you, you have real friction in the game because you've got to slide your bag along a table and you've got to get it to engage the conveyor belt into the x-ray machine. Well, these automated lanes don't do that. They, they take the bag for you and then you've got to chase it through the system. Well, these seem like, that seems like a pretty good idea. Maybe reduces some of the stress to the traveler. You can move people faster through the checkpoint. At what, what we hope would be eaten the same or even better levels of security effectiveness. Uh, although I gotta tell you, in a year-over-year in a, in a year cycle of pretty tight budgets, a daunting number of airports in which to invest, and a very slow and very cumbersome federal acquisition process, uh, it wasn't necessarily gonna be easy to introduce these. There was also a fair amount of resistance. We need new procedures and training. Remember, 
operating agencies are pretty locked into the thing that they're currently doing. But I was determined to find a way to do this because it looked like it was a way to begin to change the way we thought. So it was clear that our interests aligned perfectly with the airlines. Remember, they have the same goal we do. Our motives might be different, but they want a secure system too. For whatever reason, they'd like the airplane that took off to be the same airplane that comes back. So we'd already begun to change our relationship with them from adversarial to more collaborative. We were really much more partners in security than we had been before, and that opened a lot of new opportunities. So they needed us to be more efficient and effective in moving customers through the checkpoint. We needed to do so for the reasons I just mentioned. We needed to do it without compromising security. So I wondered, what if we could just work with the airlines to buy a couple of these automated lanes? You know, just a pilot project. So I floated the idea, and Delta was the first to take a chance and fund our experiment. They bought two lanes. They installed them in Atlanta, and they gifted them back to the federal government. That's a true public-private partnership. We established something we called the Innovation Task Force to manage the project. But here's the most amazing part. We went from idea, so this was in March of this year, we went from idea in March of 2016 to full implementation in May of 2016, in just nine weeks, not years. And these lanes do indeed move people more efficiently. Our officers like them, travelers like them, the airlines like them. And in fact, today, several major airlines are pitching in with millions of dollars, United, American, Delta, and we're installing automated lanes in major airports all over the country. Uh, in fact, you can see them right now, uh, not too far from here at Newark International Airport. Uh, we have the Federal Security Director for Newark sitting here in the front row. Uh, that United is transforming their entire Terminal C into a fully automated checkpoint. So if you fly United and you fly out of Newark, uh, you'll get a chance to experience these. Well, it turns out that this pilot project really became a catalyst for innovation throughout TSA. It also taught us that you need an incubator for innovative and entrepreneurial ideas. Remember, an operating agency is focused on everyday activities and processes, and you don't want to screw those up. So you need a place to surface, examine, and nurture change, and then introduce it into operations. So we formalized the Innovation Task Force as a permanent entity, and we assigned creative, thoughtful, and energetic people from within TSA. And then we partnered with the private sector. Because we also wanted the task force to be a receptacle for new and creative ideas from the outside. We want their job to reimagine the system and become a driver for innovative and entrepreneurial thought. To ask questions like, how can we evolve the transportation security system to meet the threats and challenges of tomorrow while reducing friction and annoyance and irritation to the traveler, raising the level of effectiveness? And how can we weave security into the very fabric of the system in the same way that safety has been integrated into every aspect of transportation. And this is important because today's threat environment is more dynamic and challenging than it's ever been. There are very real, persistent, and continuously evolving threats to transportation. This past year alone, you saw the detonation of explosives on aircraft above the Sinai and Mogadishu, airport and metro bombings in Brussels, an attack at Istanbul Airport, and of course the tragic attacks in Paris, Nice, San Bernardino, and Orlando. Terrorist groups and individuals remain intently focused on doing harm and they are creative, determined, adaptive, and ruthless. So there's a few lessons here. First, know your mission. I mean the core mission that everybody needs to be connected with. You know there's that wonderful story about the janitor at NASA during the Apollo years when someone asked him, a reporter asked him, what do you do here? And he goes, I help put a man on the moon. I mean, that's about as connected to mission as you can get. And, that's, and so that's what you want. You want, that, you want that kind of connection throughout your whole organization. You want to be that connected to your mission. Second, recognize that no one person is the change. You need to look within an organization and identify the talented, creative, and experienced folks that are ready to embrace a new way of thinking. Uh, many will not be receptive, but I guarantee you there's a core group out there of daring risk takers ready to take a plunge and follow a new idea. Then your job is to give them permission and the cover they need, and I think you'll be stunned by the results. You know, I had a mentor years ago who once said to me, he said, hey, Peter, don't just stand and point to where you want to go, just go there. He said, people will follow you. He said, sometimes they'll follow you just because they're curious. Um, then he said, once you get them over there, maybe you can convince them that it was a pretty good idea. And others will follow you because they really want to go there. 
And the ones that don't, well, maybe they're the ones that need to, uh, that need to find other lines of work. So third, in evaluating an organization's shortcoming and failures, there's always a strong temptation to blame people. Resist that temptation. It's generally a system that fails. If you put your faith in people, they'll help you fix the system. In fact, they probably already know the ways they need to fix the system. They just need permission to do it. Very few people wake up in the morning and go, gee, how can I really mess up my job today? And if they do, well, you're going to find those people real fast. Fourth, I think you've got to get some quick wins. Uh, you've got to show the organization what's possible. So our innovation task force, the training academy, uh, working with airlines to install automated lanes, those were some nice, quick, and significant things that we did. And those early wins, I think, showed us that we can change, and that change can be good, and change can work. Fifth, when you find yourself in crisis, and everybody does, Resist the instinct to just survive, get through it, and move on. You need to run to the crisis, and you need to embrace it. Because a crisis surfaces important information about an organization that allows you to address and implement some long-term solutions. A crisis may be traumatic, but it's often a necessary shock to the system and can lead to meaningful, effective change. You all remember the big story in Chicago in May of this year when uh, the mayor um, called us out to Chicago, and I stood in front of more cameras than I wanted to stand in front of, and, um, and we were taking the task for some very long uh, security lines. Well, you know, that, we could have run from that. We could have just find, found a way to blame somebody locally for that problem, but what we really realized was it gave us an opportunity to completely transform the way we did operations. And I think if, if any of you have paid attention to TSA over the summer, you know that we didn't have any long lines over the summer. That's because we've dramat we completely changed the way we operate every day. We gave a lot more authority and autonomy to individuals like Tom Carter here in the front row uh, to do the job that they needed to do. So you can make a difference. And finally, I think you have to be daring. If you're afraid to take risks, that's probably the riskiest position you can be in. Because I think it fosters a static approach that exposes vulnerabilities no matter what your line of work. But if you're in the security business, it's particularly concerning. Because if you're standing still, then it means you've been defeated already by definition because the bad guys don't stand still. They're the ultimate entrepreneurs. They're constantly looking for a way around your system. So, today I see TSA a lot differently from when I started. And you know, what's interesting is I was going through confirmation. There were a lot of people who warned me that TSA was a, was a failed agency. It was in trouble, they had low morale. Uh, it was an impossible mission. It was an unmanageable agency. And people tell me it was unmanageable. It couldn't be fixed. Well, you know, I just don't believe that. Again, you know, as I said, people don't fail, systems do. And I think systems can always be fixed. You know, TSA's got an enormous responsibility to protect the nation's transportation systems. What we do matters. It's a horrible place to be if you think you can't fix that. So to be sure, I don't think we're where we need to be, but we know where we're going. We are a good, we are a proud agency, and we have changed dramatically over the past year and a half. And we've done that by aggressively examining and questioning ourselves, by reaffirming our identity, by understanding what our true mission is, by reconnecting and collaborating with the industries and the public that we serve, and by becoming innovative and entrepreneurial. So, here's what I'll leave you with. I said know your mission, the real mission. Be like that janitor, be connected. And then no matter what your role is, know that you too can drive change. I don't care where you are in the organization. You can be creative, you can be entrepreneurial, you can be innovative. You just have to be daring and you have to lean forward to do it. You've got to take a step. And give the people around you permission and support. And if you happen to be one of those people who's above the people around you, then give them permission and support. Let them do their job. And, and of course, I never stop without saying please say thank you to the people in uniform those transportation security officers who are protecting you every single day. If you get mad at anybody, get mad at people like me, because I'm the one who tells them to do what they do. And, uh, and what they do is really important, and they, what they do, they do for a reason, and, they, and I hope they do it um, in a way that, um, that, that instills pride and confidence in all of you. So, thank you again for inviting me here today. It's, uh, it's been a real pleasure to be here. Thank you again for your patience uh, in waiting the extra hour uh, for me to arrive. I apologize for that, uh, and I look forward to any questions or discussion we may have. Thank you.
So we, uh, we have a little time for questions and uh, correspond. And I know that some students are eager to speak. So uh, why don't you go to the uh, mic and ask the questions from there? Thank you very much for joining this uh, hour of conversation. My name is Vincent Maresca, and I'm a senior student at the School of Diplomacy. Under your predecessor, John Pistole, the TSA was subject of criticism due to reports alleging that TSA agents performed uh, illegal pat-downs on passengers. How has the TSA responded to those incidents and how has your leadership of this organization made it move forward? Thank you. Okay, well, thanks for the question. Is, is this? Uh, however you like to do it, that's right. Okay, so this, uh, I can do this very, uh, I think. The, um, so first of all, with, with respect to pat-downs, uh, let's separate, I'm not sure what the illegal pat-downs are that you're referring to, but let me tell you why we do pat-downs sometimes. If somebody comes through a, a metal detector or one of those, uh, uh, what we call the advanced imaging machines, but they're really, they're really look to, they're, they're supposed to detect non-metallic explosives, and, and you get a, an alarm on that, then sometimes the only way to resolve it is by, is by physically touching you to see what it is. Sometimes we can ask you and if you can show it to us. Uh, so sometimes a pat down is necessary because it's the only way to resolve a potential threat that might be coming through. You have to be careful when you do it, and, we, and actually we've done a lot of work over the past year and a half to dramatically change the way we do that. First of all, we, we revise the procedures. We use them only for specific certain instances, and when we do it, we try to explain very carefully to a passenger exactly why we have to do that and what the purpose of it is and where we need to, to pat you down. It, it's usually just targeted to whatever the alarm was. If you have an instance where somebody's done something illegal, uh, maybe they've touched somebody inappropriately, that's a whole different situation. We work very hard to ensure that that doesn't happen. We train our people very carefully. But if you, but occasionally, like any organization, you get a bad actor. If that's the case, then we take action and we'll remove a person like that uh, from, from employment. Uh, but I think that um, the concern is, you know, how do you choose the people for pat down? Uh, it's done specifically with respect to an alarm that goes off, or in some cases because we have information or intelligence about a person that they might be a, of interest, and then and we'll pull them aside for uh, some additional screening. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Uh, my question is, with the current state of threats coming from terrorist organizations such as ISIS and Al-Qaeda, how does the TSA keep up with getting the most recent information to protect travelers nationwide? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, well, TSA, if you think about it, is really an intelligence agency first and foremost. Now, we're not a member of the intelligence community. Um, and by that, I mean we're not part of that community of agencies that, that, that work under the Director of National Intelligence. But, we're, but we have access to their information, and we do a lot of analysis of information. So, to do transportation security well, you've got to know what the threat is, and you have to know where it's coming from, and you have to know the means by which that threat gets delivered. So we spend a lot of time, and, and the operations that we do are directly tied to what we think might happen. So we spend a lot of time looking at the intelligence that's derived from, from those intelligence agencies. We analyze it with respect to the transportation system, and then we, and then we move that information rapidly into our operations, and we adjust our operations as, as necessary. So sometimes when you go through a screening, you may have something different happen to you. That's usually directly tied to some new information that we have that changes what we have to do. So we're, we have, we are embedded in other intelligence agencies, so FBI, CIA, National Security Agency, the National Counterterrorism Center, uh, and then we have uh, some of their analysts who work with us as well. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. Um, my question is, the TSA spends 2% of its budget on uh, ground transportation. So in lieu of the bomb that was found at the Elizabeth train station, do you still feel that this is an adequate amount and what more can be done to help those of us who commute by uh, trains and buses daily? Yeah, so the uh, surface transportation is a big system. You know, there, there's, there's 
buses, trains, city buses, over the road buses, um, transit systems, heavy rail, light rail, and so, so forth. It's important to put it in perspective. I have a direct responsibility. TSA has a direct responsibility for aviation security. So the bulk of our budget goes to paying for the people who are doing that work. And so that's a, you know, I have a workforce of about 60,000. Some 42,000 of those are people directly attached to the aviation sector. So if you subtract out the salaries of those people, what you find is that we roughly spend the same amount across the board. Uh, but remember, we have to, have to directly provide that service in the aviation world. In the surface world, it's indirect. You, we work with local transit authorities, uh, local law enforcement agencies, uh, local municipalities, and, and others to help set standards uh, by which everybody will abide. We do a lot of exercise programs. We do some targeted um, awareness programs and also some, some um, uh, law enforcement presence uh, that we do. We provide canines to the uh, surface transportation world. Some 600 or so canines are distributed across the country in addition to the ones that they have. So I think, so if, if you, like I said, if you put into perspective the fact that we have to directly provide surface transportation, there's actually a lot going on, or uh, aviation, there's actually a lot going on in the surface world, and we work very closely. In fact, I spent a lot of time this past year and a half talking to transit agencies, of New Jersey Transit, New York Transit, um, and, uh, and others on the way in which we prepare for it. So the things that they do, remember, it's a wide open system. You, you could, if you try to do aviation style security, you'd cripple the whole system, you'd shut it down. So, so instead what you do is you, you try to keep the system safe, meaning you, you use explosive um, detection to determine whether there's anything on trains and transit and buses. Uh, you make a lot of patrols around the area and you do, you have a, a big vigilance and awareness campaign. There's a lot of surveillance cameras uh, in place now. Um, but it's a much more open system, and, and as you tell anybody in an open system, just be aware of your surroundings and pay attention to what's going on. I would say if you could uh, elaborate on that. Uh, you are clearly very intimate with TSA now, but you have been there for a relatively short amount of time. So it seems to me that in your, that in your experience there is a strong link between leadership and learning that there is a lot of learning in leadership. And I was curious if you could elaborate on that a little oh, bit. Well, I mean, I, so I, these guys probably get, get tired of me, but I ask a lot of questions when I, uh, when, when I came here. Partly because it's, a, it's an important mission, and I really care about it, and I care about the people. Uh, and I was very concerned about some of the, uh, the criticisms of TSA. But I think you have, to be, you have to be curious if you're in this line of business. And, uh, and I've always been a very curious person. Uh, and I'm working with a lot of very curious people, people who ask questions. So, so when you stop being curious, they, they turn it back on for you because then they ask you questions about, hey, why are you doing that to us, boss? Uh, and uh, so I, um, I, I think it's a good point. I, I, you know, to me, the questions are far more important than answers because they can lead to interesting observations and discoveries that you wouldn't otherwise get. It's very easy to just default to an answer. Um, but I think you do that, you miss all sorts of opportunities. It's much more, I, I'd rather ask a question and see what comes out of the question. Okay, there's, there's another question. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I found your uh, address very insightful. I learned a lot. Um, so I'm a second year, my name is Samuel Stoley, I'm a second, second year Diplo student here at uh, St. Hall University. My question is related to security. It's so based on your past experiences and also your current experience at the TS, as the head of the TSA, uh, what do you believe is the most potent security threat to America that the TSA must grapple with? Mm. Well, I mean, there's a, there are a lot of threats out there. Um, and let me start by putting it in perspective. It's still very low probability of a terror attack on any given day. It's just the consequence is so dramatically, um, it's so dramatic that, the, that you don't want to let that happen. But I would say you got a couple of things. I mean, so there's some of the obvious ones, and we saw, um, so this, we don't know exactly what happened at Ohio State uh, University yesterday. But, uh, but there is this sort of this unpredictable nature of attacks these days. There's this kind of this lone actor approach where people go from idea to act in, in re very rapidly and in unpredictable ways. So that's, that's of some concern. Uh, I do worry about um, the disconnected nature of, of, of the security system in this country. And by that I mean this, you know, we tend to do a lot of handoffs. Hey, my job is the checkpoint, your job is the public area, you, you take care of the, the perimeter as you do the inspections over here. 
And I'd like to, I think I'd like to, you know, I'd like to see us tie the system together more, more as, a, as an ecosystem of security, if you will. Not in, a, not in that kind of overarching big brother kind of way, but just in a way that says, hey, I'm, I'm kind of safe as I move through this system. So, but the big threats are, I mean, you've still got the big terror groups out there. Um, Al-Qaeda has been active for a long time. They haven't gone away. Um, ISIL has, um, and its adherents um, bring a new kind of unpredictability and, and viciousness to the table. Um, so that's of that's some concern. I mean, I, those are the kinds of things I think about. But to, to try to pick one particular threat, I, I think it's, it's that you've got this unpredictable nature of the threat and, and a lashing out uh, in the form of some of these, some of these attacks that we've seen that is, that is particularly uh, disturbing and, 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 and frightening at times. Thank you very much. Uh, to talk to Seton Hall's uh, students and faculty. Uh, my question is, Muslims across America are now living in fear uh, that there might be a registry created or a ban on Muslim immigrants. Do you believe that these efforts would enhance security air travel? So, so I don't want to avoid your question, but, but that, that's something that, that the next administration will, will grapple with or not, as the case may be. Um, uh, and I don't want to predict, speculate upon what, uh, what the new administration will do. Let me tell you how I think about security. Um, because I think that, that it, first of all, uh, TSA doesn't look at race, origin, religion, ethnicity, anything like that. I mean, it, if you do, it immediately, it immediately diverts your attention from the real issue. What we look at is, what do we know about you? So I like people to be in known traveler programs identify yourself to the system, because if you identify yourself to the system, you're less likely to be somebody I need to worry about. Bad guys don't usually tell you, hey, here I am. Uh, I look at, what are your travel demographics? You know, where do you go? You know, if you're spending a lot of time in places in the world that, uh, that could cause some concern, and you're hanging around with people that cause us concern, then I don't care, I don't care what you look like, what your religion is, and where you come from, I'm gonna pay a little more attention to you. So I wanna screen you against databases of known or suspected terrorists. I also want to screen you against the criminal databases to find out whether or not you, you've done something that I need to be concerned about. You know, an awful lot of the people that we catch coming through checkpoints are people who are wanted for crimes and, uh, and felonies, and we turn them over to um, the local authorities. So, so I think, from a security perspective, what you focus on are, are the kinds of things, the kinds of behaviors kinds of travel behaviors, the kinds of um, associations that you've had with people that we know to be not such good people uh, as, a, as, as a means of indicating. You look at the intelligence that's telling us what are, the, what are the kinds of things, what are the kinds of behaviors, what are the kinds of ac activities that indicate somebody may be doing something that we're concerned about. More importantly, are you connected with people we already know to be criminals or terrorists or associated with terrorists? And then we'll pay more attention to you. I'll still let, I mean, I may still let you travel. It's not that you can't travel that, but I'm gonna ask you more, more questions and I'm gonna pay a little bit more attention to you. So those are the kinds of things I think about. And again, like I said, I'm not trying to avoid the question, but I, 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 don't, I can't answer that question because um, I don't speak for that administration. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Trisha Bocard, I'm a junior here at the School of Diplomacy. Um, and my question um, is really, when considering security concerns, the focus is usually on the personnel. Um, and I'm wondering, do you think there are any infrastructural measures or changes um, in transportation that could help maintain security beyond just the personnel? I mean, the, the, the personnel work for TSA or, well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I think some of what we're doing with these um, automated screening lanes is a step towards that. So what I'd like to do is, is, is kind of push machines to what machines do best and, and then let humans do what humans do. What humans do best is talk to other humans, you know, and, and, and pay attention to other humans. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> if you train them. <laughs> yeah, sometimes if you, you pay ignore, attention. If, if you, you pay attention. And if you're curious, yeah. because sometimes. <laughs> yeah. but, but I tell you, one of the, one of the, one of the hardest jobs on, uh, in, in the security screening environment, if you're looking at an, an aviation screening environment, is sitting there watching an x-ray machine you know, image after image after image, 
And if you, if you track the psychology or the, or, the, or, the, or the behavior of somebody, you know, there's a point at which you get really good, and then it starts to drop off again. And, and so you have a little window where you're really paying attention, and then you start to lose interest again. So I'd love to see, and we've been doing some work with, uh, with like the IBM Watson folks and other machine learning and, 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 and learning intelligence um, uh, software to see whether you could train a computer to do that. Computers don't get tired and they keep looking. So can you teach them how to do things? And we've been playing with the IBM folks and they've been looking at things like, first can it learn to identify a weapon? And something simple, like something that really looks like a pistol. And then can you take that thing apart and have it identify the parts? And then can you distribute those parts over a couple of different bags and have it put it all together and say, hey, I just think I saw a whole bunch of things that could be put together to make a weapon. So that's very promising. So that's one example of, of some things to do. But, and I think there's a lot more like that out there uh, that could, uh, it could ease, the, ease the kind of the, the, the heart mind numbing piece of the job for humans and let humans do what humans do best. So humans are very happy to hear it to talk. <laughs> but I think that it's also good for us to bring it to a close. And I think that we have a way to do it. I apologize to the students that did not have a chance to ask that question, but I'm sure that you will stay long yeah, and stay with we'll us. Make up for the front half by sticking around for the latter half. Thank you so much again, Administrator, for being with us today. On behalf of the School of Diplomacy and St. Hall University, I would like to present you with this token of our appreciation. Oh, thank you very much. Kill the stream. All right.